The scripture reading today is Psalm 1. Hear the word of God. Happy are those who do not follow the vice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by the stream of water, which yield their fruit in each season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in, judge, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. The Reverend Sukja Khan will now deliver the message, The Endless Source of Joy. Happy, happy Lunar New Year this morning. I know many of you like to listen to Christian podcasts or watch YouTube sermons, but I conjecture not many of you take time to read and study the Bible on your own on a daily basis. Do you find reading the Bible challenging or boring? So in other words, we don't find it delightful. So this morning, I want to give you the big pictures about the scriptures to change your attitude toward the Bible. Ultimately, I hope you come to experience Bible is the endless source of joy that enriches your life. <clears throat> I'm sure that you are familiar with the Book of Psalms, and many of you pray with the Book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms has 150 poems in five different books. And it is also called as the Psalter. And the Psalter is a book of praises, song with musical instruments, and years in Asian Jewish worship services. Some of Psalms are the most beautifully written poetry. And poet Psalms in general portrays the human conditions in different life situations, and the psalmist deal with the gamut of emotions such as fear, sadness, happiness, grief, guilt, and joy. So some of the psalms express very really honest human emotions like hatred for their enemies and sometimes disrespect and disappointment toward God. So the Book of Psalms invites you to bring whatever you have, your naked self to God and sometimes challenge God in face of your trouble. The psalmist illumines humor interactions with God when they go through real life situations. So Psalm 1 has dual functions, introduction and invitation to the book of Psalms. So the first psalm is the preamble to the rest of the psalms, guiding us readers how to read the rest of the psalms. So in a nutshell, Psalm 1 presents two ways of living your life, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Let us take a moment to ponder about what is wicked and what is righteous. Is the boundary between the wicked and righteous clearly defined? Probably not. Discerning the wicked from the righteous 
is far more complicated than it may first appear because we are very complex beings with many layers of nuance. Clean life is not so black and white. And I don't know about you, but I feel sometimes I am wicked and other times I am righteous over the course of my life. The psalmist invites us to examine our unexamined assumptions about the wicked and the righteous. The first psalm takes us to complicated spaces to reflect on on what we think we are and what, who we really are. So who are the wicked and who are the righteous? Is it an exclusive individual proposition or <clears throat> the righteous and wicked at the same time? I'm gonna tell you a story and we'll let you decide by yourself. So recently I watched cooking reality competition show pressure cooker on netflix have you ever watched the show and i love cooking so whatever cooking show i watch on netflix <clears throat> so every episode presents a high strong competition in which 11 chefs compete to win one hundred thousand dollars they live together in the duration of a competition. So each chef competes against each other individually or in a pair. So 11 chefs come from a varied background, ethnic background, the cultural background, and wide spectrum of personalities. They are relatively young. Some of them are only in their 20s, and most of them are in their 30s. The twist of this program is chefs judge each other in each round except the two rounds, and eventually decide the final winner of the competition. <clears throat> So here's a human wickedness that creeps in. So chefs make decisions not based on the quality of food, but based on fear or self-interest. This, this particular chef named Gina is voted one of the three worst chefs in the first round, but she managed to survive. Later rounds, she lobbies around and many place other chefs to vote out one of the best chefs, Lana. And interestingly enough, other chefs concede with her and vote Lana out of the competition. I was really shocked. So the cooking show really demonstrates how easily people become wicked in a pressured situation. So what do you think? I don't think we are far from them. We can always fall for wickedness out of fear and or self-centeredness, depending on the situation. The scripture reading that is new revised standard version updated edition opens with the term happy. And other translations use the term blessed. So happy and blessed are interchangeably used throughout the entire Bible. People who lived over 2,000 years ago when the psalm was written are not different from us. Every human being searches for happiness. And the first time, the first psalm elicits what it means to be truly happy. To give you the true meaning of happiness, in this context, I'm going to cite Psalm scholar Clint McCann. He says, for someone, happiness involves not enjoying oneself, 
but delight in the teaching of God. The goal of life is to be found not in self-fulfillment, but in praising God. Prosperity does not involve getting what you want, whether it comes from being connected to God. So happiness is not about <clears throat> our cozy human feelings, nor about getting what we want. Instead, for us God's people, happiness is about doing what pleases God. The alignment of God's will should make us happy. The psalmist depicts the blessed person's behavior in two ways. First, he describes what they do not do. They do not walk the advice of the wicked. They do not take the path that sinners tread, and they do not sit in the seat of scoffers. In the pressure cooker program, the chef exemplified all these behaviors of the wicked. Then the psalmist switched from negative description to the positive account of the blessed. They delight in the law of God and meditate upon the law of God. The law of the Lord, or Torah of Yahweh, in a strict sense, refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. However, the law of the Lord is a somewhat misleading because it's not confined to the law. And I think Jesus succinctly summarizes what the law of the Lord is in two commencements in Matthew chapter 22, verses 20, uh, 37 to 40. He says, you shall love your God, the, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is the second like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and prophets. Therefore, in a broadest sense, the law of the Lord entails the love for God and neighbors. John Kelvin contends that Torah of Yahweh, the law of the God, refers to the whole of scripture. The blessed person is the one who delights in the teaching of God. How can we delight in the Torah of Yahweh? And when do you find delight? in something. So delighting in something is a tie to the domain of human affections. It indicates the direction of your heart and passion. So to delight in the Torah is equivalent to rejoicing it and longing for it. We should long for the word of God more than gold and enjoy it more than honey as Psalm 19 2 says, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold and sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. The prophet Jeremiah says, your words became to me a joy and delight of my heart in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. The first psalm highlights the delight, which is the affection that draws us close to God. Delight involves our heart, and this is what Jesus' first commandment, loving the Lord your God with all your heart. 
French-American theologian and biblical scholar Samuel Terrain <coughs> denotes the righteous man who rejects the influence of the ungodly find his physical and mental vigor in the delights afforded by the law of Yahweh. So Christian heart should long for God's word and embrace it with affection and joy. For scripture, <clears throat> it is the unending source of joy. Psalm 1 underlines the word of God should be enticed by delight rather than out of obligation or duty. Meditation is not unique to Christianity. All other religions practice meditation, even secular <clears throat> people meditate. But Christian meditation is different from all other religions. Meditation doesn't mean sitting quietly in solitude. The Hebrew word for meditate, haga, means manner. So meditation involves making sound. In ancient Jewish culture and Orthodox Jewish tradition, they murmur Torah all day long. I'm sure you've seen movie Jewish people, they shake their body back and forth and murmur the Torah. <clears throat> so we do lots of self-talk when we are alone, whether you are aware of it or not. So you intentionally self-talk, talk to yourself about scripture other than anything else. Christian meditation requires the active engagement of the mind to understand God's will and to gain strength to live out his will. It's a dynamic process. Meditation in the word of God enlightens to the discernment of what is wicked and wisdom to choose against it. The constant meditation on scripture strengthens our holding to stand against the wicked, even if it costs us. Eventually, we will bear fruit. Do you want to live your life in its fullness? Most of us here are in the final chapter of our lives. Do you want to finish it well? If your answer is yes, rejoice the word of God and experience the power of the word of God. How can we meditate on the word of God day and night to live godly life? I am going to suggest four practical ways. First, set a specific time and place. You know when and where you will be least distracted for meditation. So early in the morning or late at night and quiet place are preferred. Secondly, begin with a prayer. Prayer to the Holy God, the Holy Spirit to guide you through your meditation. Prayer for wisdom and insight for a difficult passage. Thirdly, choose a small segment of the passage and dig deeper into the meaning of the passage. Taking notes and memorizing might be helpful. Finally, take time to think about how you can apply the passage to your daily life situation and end with a prayer to the Holy Spirit to empower you to live at the passage. Keep practicing until meditation becomes part of your daily routine. So what is the outcome of delight led meditation on the word of God day and night? We will become in line with God's will and consequently live out his will joyfully 
we may encounter a situation that lures us in to follow the wicked way, but meditation on the word constantly enable us to walk the path of the righteous. Flip side of it is that we are inclined to choose the path of the wicked without constant meditation on the word of God. The imagery of trees planted next to the streams of water whose root always find the nourishment to bear fruit and whose leaves never wither represent a person who delights in and hold on the word of God. And as a hiker, I encounter this image on the trail often. And the flourishing trees enduring so many years of a drought must have a deep roots in streams of water underground. The word of God is like water. The word of God makes us thrive like the water makes the tree flourish. The life of the wicked is described in diagonal opposition to the thriving, life-giving, fruitful tree. The three characteristics of the righteous painted in verse three correspond to three descriptors of the wicked. Wicked are chaps that has no root, lack of value, and wither leaf. And chaff will be blown away by the wind. They have no place in the presence of God. The English Standard Bible translates the last verse, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The verb know in the Bible doesn't simply refer to intellectual knowledge or awareness, but it refers to intimate knowledge and involvement. This verse invites us to choose between two ways, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. The way of the righteous is God's way, and the way of the wicked is our own way. The way of the righteous is other centeredness and the way of the wicked is a self-centered way. We think it's no brainer to choose which way, but the world we live in is complex and diverse. Besides, we are far more complex and messier than who we think we are. So the decision is not so simple unless we are deeply rooted in the word of God. Depending on which way you choose, you will either live a blessed life known by God or will perish. The choice is yours. We, will, we all search for happiness as happiness is never ending human desire. Someone provides wisdom to our true happiness. Let me recap, the true happiness is not about your feeling or getting what you want. True happiness is rooted in the connectedness to God through his word. True happiness comes from spiritual maturity. Do you, long, do you honestly long for spiritual maturity? so that you, you will not walk in the wicked way. And do you want bless life? Someone provides wisdom to live a blessed life. The surest way is to delight in and meditate on the words of God day and night. I want to conclude my sermon with a prayer 
the Pope by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God.